Alrighty, I think we can go ahead and get started. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending when you're dialing in to our webinar today. Uh, and thank you for joining. Um, just before we get started, I want to make sure everyone is aware that this webinar will be recorded um, and uploaded to our YouTube page as well as sent out uh, in a couple of days from our marketing team. So if you need to leave later on or if you're watching the recording, welcome and, uh, and we can get started. Today's webinar is on um, collecting good data. So there are tips and tricks to ensure accurate data collection in Google Analytics. Um, and we're going to go through some of the techniques to identify when you have good data or not and how to resolve it with some quick tips and tricks uh, for your organization. A little bit about me and uh, InfoTrust, your uh, presenting company. Uh, my name is Amin Shaki. I'm the managing director of the MENA office uh, for InfoTrust. InfoTrust is a web analytics and consulting uh, company product development company as well. We do these types of webinars and educational events all year long with multiple different clients. We support thousands of sites for our different uh, size clients, enterprises, all the way down to medium-sized organizations. We have offices in Cincinnati uh, as well as in Dubai, and that's where I'm dialing from today is Dubai UAE. Uh, we have various certifications with Google, so um, hopefully this gives you some confidence that we know what we're talking about when it comes to Google Analytics, digital analytics, um, and how to make sure you have the proper setup for your platforms. Uh, the webinar today is going to run about 40 to 45 minutes, I'm hoping, so we can leave some room for questions at the end. Of course, feel free to ask me questions throughout. I have the um, questions pane and chat panel open on my screen. I'm not sure if you guys can see it with what you can uh, access, but I'm keeping an eye on those as we go through the slides. Um, and again, if there's any follow-up questions after this session, feel free to ping us uh, on our website. I'll even put my email at the very last slide there to follow up. So let's get started. As far as the agenda for today, uh, we have just a few different sections, uh, with the majority of the time being spent in section three. But the first part is to review your digital analytics strategy. I mean, to understand if you have accurate data collection or not, you first need to understand what data you need or not. Um, getting that strategy in place, that foundation, okay, here's where we need to go or here are the KPIs we need to track, that is the first step to actually understanding if you're tracking it properly or not. Building a tracking plan for your website uh, and or mobile application. I'm just going to go through some quick tips for how to repair or actually set up the process to properly implement and deploy analytics tracking some common pitfalls to avoid or how to address them, things to keep in mind. This will be a lot of lists that you guys can take back to your organization and almost perform like a mini audit uh, or review of your tracking uh, to ensure you have accurate data collection. And then some testing processes and recommend recommendations for how to actually go through an audit, if you will. So let's jump in. Uh, first, a shameless uh, note here is that we've done this type of webinar before. Uh, in fact, we've done this webinar quite a few times, uh, updating it every time as the products change, as the organizations mature. Um, and really for our clients and organizations we work with, we do this type of assessment all the time to really understand, are they tracking accurate data? Are they tracking the KPIs that they need? And how can we leverage that further? But um, in previous webinars, even dating back a few years, you can see some of our older slides here, um, we always would start with getting everyone in the mindset for what is important to track? What are your key KPIs? What is your strategy? What are your long-term plans? Because it's really important to understand where and what information you need in order to really start validating if it's accurate or not. So these are the, some of the questions that we would recommend asking yourself or asking your organizations to build that initial plan before really assessing if something's tracking well or not because maybe it's not even needed and you don't need to spend time there. Time is the most valuable resource, so really understanding what you need to review is, uh, is the key step one. Now, our process when we work with organizations, and this is the reason I'm sharing this is because maybe this is something you want to adopt with your organizations or uh, who you work with, we break it out into stages. And the first one, as you can see, lots of time spent in just understanding the needs, 
understanding the KPIs, the reports, and the decisions that can be made from different reports or, or uh, measurements. Then we consolidate all the requirements, put together an audit, review the current setup. For today's session, we're going to talk about Google Analytics, obviously, specifically. Uh, but then building the architecture, rolling it out, and testing, that's kind of secondary because first you need that clear plan of where and what you need before uh, you can actually start implementing everything. Oftentimes, organizations try and track everything under the sun just in case, but then you get really bogged down trying to validate really minor things that are not going to drive the business value or really should not be where your organization spends the most time and effort in analyzing because it's not really going to lead to improvements or actions. Um, so when we put together the, all the needs and requirements, we even prioritize those for what will drive action and ultimately drive revenue or cap, um, impact within the business. And anything else we kind of table or put into a backlog for future implementation. So as you're beginning your process of checking how your data collection is set up, start asking the questions, do we need this? Is this really important? Is this going to help us make the right business decisions or not? What we start with is always building a wish list or just KPIs, things that you want to track. Uh, even if this is everything under the sun from various different teams that you're working with, um, things that you might think in your mind, this is not valuable, let's table it. Capturing it and documenting it just so you have a record is useful um, and really the first starting point to understanding what type of information you should have or you need for your uh, structure. So what I'm showing here is just a screenshot from one of our example documents that we put together with our clients to understand areas that they need to understand or, or want to track um, and descriptions of the, those different KPIs or elements that we need to um, set up. And then the requirement detail, I'll block that out because that's more specific values or, or targets that clients might have to accomplish certain uh, marketing initiatives. So making sure stocks are up to date or the right channels and revenues uh, being accomplished, that would be under the requirement detail tab. So I didn't want to spend too much time. Again, I want to get to the good stuff of identifying um, areas that might be causing issues with data collection. Um, but that's all at a very high level from uh, building a digital analytics strategy, some of the steps that we've taken in the past. Uh, as far as getting a little bit more technical, building a tracking plan to match those KPIs is sort of the next step. But to start, I want to talk a little bit about how Google Analytics collects data. So ensuring data collection, a big part of that is understanding how data is collected in the first place. So this image summarizes a little bit of how Google Analytics works. Um, the first image on the very top right I can talk about for a quick minute is uh, in recent years, Google has updated the technology to be able to track mobile application data and web platform data together into a single property. Many organizations today, particularly in the Middle East, have mobile applications, uh, even mobile, mobile apps that are either hybrid, meaning parts of it are native app views, other parts of it are web views kind of mixed together, or the experience is so similar when users are going to the app versus web that understanding cross-device behavior is really important. So Google has the capability with Google Analytics to set up that cross-device uh, reporting. And that's almost the first tip there is to understand with your organization, should you track your platforms together so you have a holistic view that you can also segment out across different platforms? Or does it make more sense to split them up if the platforms are completely different like your mobile app is purely informational, but your website or web platforms are transactional, maybe they don't make sense to track together in a single property, but actually split up. First sign, if you see lots of data missing from your uh, analytics properties, is to make sure that all of your platforms actually have data collected in the first place. Some organizations we work with say, you know, we don't have the same number of orders in our GA account as we do in our back end but we realized that half of their platforms aren't even tracked or they're tracked in a separate property and they didn't even know about it. So you can combine those together and get a really good holistic view. Now, as far as technically how GA works, this image simplifies the steps that occur. When a website or mobile app loads, if you have Google Analytics implemented, the JavaScript or Google Tag Manager with GA through it, um, 
it'll begin to load and collect data from the browser or device automatically. So all this information, like what device is used, the time of day, the source of traffic, um, various, what page they're on, what screen, et cetera, various information is tracked automatically when the Google Analytics code begins to fire. For websites, it's packaged, or data is also grabbed off of the browser cookie uh, or cookies on the browser. Um, for devices like mobile apps, information from the device might be grabbed, like the app version, app name, etc. cetera. Um, all of this information is packaged into a hit request um, or a GIF sent off to the Google servers where it's processed, aggregated, and spit out into the API and into the UI, uh, Google Analytics user interface. So along each one of these stages, there could be a drop in data collection. Um, for example, if you don't have Google Analytics on all of your pages or screens, obviously you're gonna miss some of your data. We'll talk about that pitfall a little bit later. But also in the processing or aggregation of the data within the Google settings, you might actually lose some data accuracy in this stage because you might have misconfigured settings. Um, things like filters that are incorrect or uh, checkboxes that are not fully understood that are used on the uh, Google Analytics setup, you know, various other things that, again, we'll go through could cause the output of the reports or the data that you're looking at to be inaccurate. So when we perform our audits, we both do a technical review of the websites or mobile apps, see how the data is actually being sent before they hit the Google servers, then understanding how Google actually processes or aggregates the data this is all in Google Analytics as well under the property settings where you can modify how Google actually crunches the data or displays it. But then even then the reports themselves, how you configure the reports can impact the accuracy of the data you're looking at. So we'll get into all of those pitfalls a little bit later. Um, this slide just explains a little bit of the list, or I guess the list of ways that Google tracks information. So I already mentioned on-site interactions and automatic uh, dimensions and metrics, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But there's also other ways that Google Analytics can receive data, such as from other Google products, from integrations, or uh, settings that are enabled, such as the double-click third-party data, where you can get demographic and interest information. Even imported data or data sent in from a non-website, non-app platform, that can all be aggregated and shown in Google Analytics as well. And it's worth noting that if you have Google Analytics set up on your website or app, and you're also running advertising or you have other sources of information, um, without building that integration into Google Analytics, it might appear that Google Analytics is inaccurate, but really it just doesn't have all of the inputs that it needs from these other systems. For example, uh, there's a free integration with Google AdWords. So if you're running paid search with Google AdWords, many of you are probably are, and understand that you can integrate those with Google Analytics. If you don't integrate all of your AdWords accounts with Google Analytics, you might have some data in GA showing revenue orders or goal completions tied to a different source or without a campaign value, without a keyword, et cetera. So it looks like the data is just not there or inaccurate, you can't make good decisions, but it's simply an integration problem. Um, even if you were to turn off the AdWords integration, turn it back on, that gap in time could affect the data that's displayed in Google Analytics, um, or if you create new accounts, new campaigns, uh, you want to make sure that information is integrated ahead of time. Even though Google Analytics will track the sessions and hits that occur on-site or in-app, understanding more information about those hits, like where users are coming from, is key here and a key reminder, or a tip, I suppose, to, to keep in mind. So these are the other ways that Google collects data. Um, note that in this bottom portion here where we talk about data import and measurement protocol, these are more advanced ways to bring in data into GA. We have a tool ourselves that we built Analyzely to, that can help automate some of the data importing process from external data sets. But keep in mind that you'll need to have a firm grasp on how your data is collected off the site or app first before you can import against it or send in hits from other platforms because uh, if you import data incorrectly, um, you might change how some of the reports or outputs actually appear. For example, if you're importing information about users 
uh, you have a user database, you have information about your users that are not tracked on site, but tracked in your backend uh, via sales people that are interacting with customers or just other ways customers can interface with your business. Bringing that data into Google Analytics without a user ID tracked in GA, you would never be able to see that data for one. Or if you have the incorrect user ID or the attributes aren't very clean in your import file, the output in GA might will also be incorrect. So if you mix up different metrics and dimensions that describe your users, Google Analytics is not going to be able to automatically fix that. It takes the data as is. So you might be looking at information that's not properly configured and therefore leading to poor marketing decisions. As far as how Google Analytics outputs data or collects it, there's two core fundamental attributes uh, or parts that build all dashboards, reports, segments, etc. And these are dimensions and metrics. Uh, dimensions describe data. They're the actual strings or values that are being collected. Uh, things like city or device type or um, time of day, things like that that are actual values. These are all dimensions. Or metrics are measurements of those dimensions. Counts, calculations, percentages, etc. These are all metrics that define or describe dimensions even further. In Google, Anal Google Analytics, you can have free-floating metrics, meaning you can build a dashboard to see total revenue or total orders, total sessions, etc. But with a dimension, you will always need a metric to tie to it to describe more about it. Um, so you can't just have a list of devices that were used to access a site. You need to have a metric, like a list of devices used to access a site in order of how many sessions there were from each device or how many orders, etc. When you put dimensions and metrics together in any table report within Google Analytics, you should yield some insights. And in GA, there's an ABC model for how metrics are displayed, acquisitional metrics, behavioral metrics, and conversion metrics. Uh, note that the conversion metrics need some configuration. Uh, if you're an e-commerce business, you'll have to set up the e-commerce tracking on the confirmation page uh, of your website or mobile app. Or if you are an e-commerce site or even not an e-commerce site and you want to track specific user interactions as conversions, you'll have to configure those as well as goals uh, in your GA setup once you get the tracking in place. Um, dimensions and metrics are the output of the data collection that we talked about in the previous slide. Now the reason I wanted to explain the background about how Google collects data, what dimensions and metrics are and how they can be used is because it all ties back to your goals and KPIs. So I mentioned earlier to create that wish list of requirements or KPIs and things that you want to track. This is even before you look into Google Analytics. This is an exercise with your organization, with your team to understand what data do we need to make the best decisions. Once you have that documented, then you can come back to, okay, what data can we track in Google Analytics? What are the dimensions or metrics available? And how do they map together? So we create a mapping file to say, these are your key KPIs, things that you might need, and here are the values or attributes, dimensions or metrics, that we need to collect on what specific actions. Um, so putting this mapping together is what's the, the next step uh, beyond just understanding the key KPIs and high level what we want. Mapping it together to specific actions and attributes we need to track is what we use to actually build then the implementation specs or, or the guide. Now, if you already have Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager set up on your site, building a new guide might not be as needed, um, unless from your analysis or from the pitfalls that we're going to get to, you see that data is really not matching. Uh, you might need to do a clean implementation or at least review the implementation that's been done. And this is what we spend a lot of our time with our organizations or our clients is to understand how do they deploy things on their sites or apps and do they match back to the KPIs or the key strategies that that organization has. One, if it doesn't, then we scrap it. Why have that excess uh, data tracking if it doesn't lead back to actionability? Or if it does, then is it properly set up to really give the easiest and clearest view in GA? Now, to understand if you have the easiest, clearest view in GA or what might not be working or not, it's a good transition to understanding the pitfalls that can um, come with analytics setup uh, and things to keep in mind or avoid. 
So I split this up into a few various sections. I wanted to spend some time walking through each one of these. Um, the first pitfall is incorrect technical setup. When I say technical setup, I mean the implementation of Google Analytics on your website or mobile application, technically speaking, was not done properly. And there's a couple, uh, a few different things to keep in mind or to look out for uh, to check if this is done properly. First is if you have an app and web platform, are they tracked together or are they tracked separately? Um, I already talked through a little bit of the capabilities with GA that you can combine data together or not. But this is important to keep in mind when you're running your numbers or looking at user count, session count, order count, etc. Having a full view across platforms is probably a good start, but how do you need to display it to your business? Um, if everyone is only expecting web platform data, make sure you don't include your mobile platform data in any reporting that you present. Uh, from a technical perspective, though, you can track these into one Google Analytics property, but they're set up uh, in their own special way. JavaScript on web platforms and um, via the SDKs on mobile apps. A very common first look that we check is um, if Google Analytics is actually on every page or screen of the web or app. Simply because if Google Analytics is missing on any page or screen, it can break the entire journey um, or, or consistency of your data. For example, let's say you have three pages on your site, page A, B, and C. If page A has Google Analytics, page B does not have Google Analytics, but page C does have Google Analytics, and the user goes from A to B to C, what would happen is this. A session would begin on page A uh, with a user seeing that page. User would navigate to page B. Nothing would happen because page B is not being tracked. As soon as a user navigates to page C, what potentially could happen is that page C would start tracking GA. GA would look to see where is this user coming from. Oh, they came from a page before this page, but that page didn't have Google Analytics, so it must be a new user, new session. Not new user, new session, because assuming this is all on the same browser. So it's a new session because there was tracking missing in the middle of the whole flow. Of course, there's ways to help repair that, which is using things like referral exclusion rules on your own domain. So when Google Analytics would load on page C, it would see it's the same domain on page B where they're coming from as page C, so it won't track it that new hit as a new session, but you're still missing that tracking on page B. So page B, when you run your reports and look to see what are our most popular pages or content, Page B is not popular at all, but it's actually because it's not even tracking. So the insights and the business decisions might be flawed if you don't have full deployment. Uh, a sub part of that is where Google Analytics and tag your tag management system, if you're using one, is located. Um, before, about six months ago, um, Google would always recommend putting their tag manager, Google Tag Manager, and Google Analytics at the top of the body uh, of the source code. Uh, technically speaking, but they recently changed the processings to allow for adding Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager in the head section of your of your website. Um, in apps, it's a little bit different. It's just an SDK that's implemented directly on there. But for web, this is critical. If your Google Analytics snippet or Google Tag Manager snippet um, are not located in the head section, but let's say they're located at the bottom of the body or in the footer, there's risk that it might not load fast enough between users navigating through your site. And again, you might have missing pages or incomplete session tracking. Having it in the head section not only helps ensure that the data will for sure be tracked fast, it's the first thing that's loaded on the site, but also it gives you capability to launch things like A-B testing tools, A-B testing platforms, and just have more validation or more confidence that data will accurately be tracked even if users have slow internet connections um, because it's the first thing that loads within the head section. Um, a similar note to code missing on any pages or screens is uh, code being duplicated. So we do see this sometimes where Google Analytics is deployed through a tag manager as well as directly on the source code. That causes double tracking and for sure your uh, data will not be accurate. It'll be highly inflated. Um, or you might have some organizations that deploy 
two different tracking snippets for two different properties. So they're trying to collect data off to two different places. But without modifying at least one of those two scripts to be unique, Google will actually deduplicate the hits at the point of collection and only pass it to one property. So this is really important to keep in mind the tracker name or the tracker settings you have if you need to deploy multiple snippets. Some of you might be asking, why would you ever have more than one snippets or properties needing on a, needed to be tracked on a particular site? But for multi-brand, multi-site organizations, uh, you might have the HQ team that wants to see across all brands the data uh, or sites or markets. But at the lower level, at the market, brand, or site owner level, they might only want to see their data. So this would be a reason to have potentially two separate tracking codes, uh, particularly for non-Google Analytics 360, like Google Analytics free uh, users. It might be good to have those uh, separated out. With GA360, you can actually have roll-up properties built into the product. Uh, so this kind of cleans it up and you can still have just one tracking snippet per page potentially, or per app. Now a few other things to keep in mind is if you have virtual page views, this is when you might want to track something like a pop-up or an Ajax request or something of that nature as a page view, emulating a page reload or window load. Um, but oftentimes we've seen in the past that some organizations go get a little carried away with implementing how many virtual page views there are, or they implement it incorrectly. So the design through maybe a tag manager was to track a virtual page view on one button click that loads a pop-up, but unfortunately it started tracking many other buttons just because it was improperly configured, uh, not properly configured. So this can really inflate them or the number of page views you have and even your session counts potentially. Now getting a little bit deeper because these are all general tracking items, for some hits and depending what you're trying to track, um, or you might need to validate certain attributes are included in those hits, in those page views or events or completed orders, etc. cetera. Um, for example, on a thank you confirmation page for an e-commerce business, you'll probably want to track the transaction ID, the order revenue, the products that were purchased, the quantity, et cetera. All of these different dimensions are attributes that are required in the technical tracking or in the hit itself. Google cannot automatically grab the order ID, revenue, um, products, et cetera, from the thank you page to collect it in the reports. You need to identify in the Google Analytics tracking snippet or in your tag manager what attributes to grab and when to pass them in with your tracking. Um, enhanced e-commerce with Google Analytics, we've had a couple other webinars about this. This is absolutely critical. There's so many specific attributes that are required on every single type of action. Add to cart needs some certain type of parameters passed in or attributes in that particular hit versus checkout versus purchase. If those are not added, even one or two attributes are not included in those specific actions, the entire report in Google Analytics might not populate. So there's very specific attributes and, and key uh, dimensions that are needed to populate uh, the reports. One example being the product action when it comes to enhanced e-commerce. Other things to keep in mind that might affect how you're looking at Google Analytics is some special uh, collection limitations or nuances. So one key one um, thing to keep in mind with how Google Analytics tracks is the hits per session limit. Uh, this is not really publicly known or shared as much, but Google will only process up to 500 hits per session before they stop collecting additional hits for that same session. Now a hit, just to take a step back here, a hit is any time data is sent off of the website or app to Google servers. This can be in the form of a page view when the page loads or reloads, a screen view on mobile apps when a screen loads, uh, or an event, a user interaction. So if you're tracking when someone clicks on Add to Cart, in Google Analytics, you're tracking that add to cart action or event, that would be considered a hit. Now, 500 hits per session would be a really large amount of engagement. But if you're an organization like our clients that track things like scrolling uh, or product impressions on scroll, this number can get up pretty high pretty quickly. So with Google Analytics standard or free, 
you only have 500 hits per session. This is important to note if you have tracking everywhere on every single button click after 15 seconds, you send an event, uh, et cetera, you know, every single user interaction you're tracking as a hit, you might be reaching your hit limit before the conversion occurs, like an order uh, completion. One organization that we worked with in the past, on every page they were sending in 20 hits because they wanted to track 20 different attributes. And they thought the best way to do that was to send one event per attribute. Um, what was happening is by page, you know, by going through their checkout process, by the time someone got to the checkout confirmation page, 500 hits were already accomplished well before that. So they were not being tracked as far as their conversions uh, were concerned. So what we did is just combined all those attributes and events into a single event, making sure those data attributes were properly configured in that one single event. So it helped improve their hits per session limit and consolidate a lot of their um, requests happening offsite. So the developers were also happy that there was less JavaScript and um, requests going back and forth. Uh, again, with GA Premium or GA360, the enterprise version of Google Analytics, there's actually a higher limit of 2,000 hits per session uh, upon request. So if you're an organization that has GA360, you've invested in that enterprise product, you can uh, request a higher hits per session as well. Um, one other note about uh, like a special collection nuance is what a non-interaction event is. This is a little bit complicated, but it's worth mentioning. If you're tracking events uh, or user interactions, not just the typical page view or screen view and, and reloads, but you're tracking when someone's clicking on something or scrolling, etc. cetera, um, if you set that event, there's a setting whether to make it a non-interaction event or default to have it just be an interaction event. What that means is, should this interaction, should this click or, or whatever a user is doing, affect bounce rate and time on site or should it not? Um, if you set non-interaction to true, that means I want to see when someone does this particular action, but I don't want it to affect my bounce rate or other metrics. Uh, an example of why you want, might want to do that is if you're tracking scrolling, when someone comes to a site, you might not want to track immediately when they start scrolling an event that is an interaction because then your bounce rate is very, very low. And bounce rate is a good indication of engagement because bounces occur when only one hit is tracked in a single session, meaning someone came to the site and immediately left. They didn't do anything else. So it might be good to set all scroll-based events as non-interaction true. So you're still tracking the fact that that happened, but you're not actually affecting your bounce rate because you know just because someone comes to the site and scrolls barely, if they leave right after that, they're not engaged. So maybe you want them to be counted as a bounce still, but still see the fact that they scrolled a little bit. That's just one example for non-interaction events. Uh, this can also affect the user count because if you have a non-interaction event occur without a regular interaction hit, like a page view or an event, a uh, normal event, you'll count a user, but you might not count sessions. So if you ever see that you have more users than sessions, logically that doesn't make sense because for every user they have to have at least one session. But most likely what's happening is you have some non-interaction events uh, that are occurring without actual interaction events or page views occurring. This can happen if, say, someone comes to the site to the home page, um, and then they leave for an hour, so their first session expires, and the first thing they do when they get back is just scroll a little bit, but all of your scroll events are non-interaction true. Those scroll events will be tracked in GA as non-interaction events. The user count would be incremented, because hey, this is a user, they're scrolling, but your session count will not be incremented because it's set as non-interaction true to not affect sessions and therefore not affect bounce rate and other calculations. Um, on that same token, if you have events without page views, for whatever reason, if your site or app, you only set up uh, event tracking, not page view or screen view tracking, your landing pages or landing screens might be very unusual, say not set or not defined, et cetera. Um, that, that just means that events have been occurring without a page or a screen view, because landing page or landing screen as a dimension will only be populated on a page view or screen view hit. Now these are just a number, uh, just an example of 
pitfalls and, and things that we see more often. These are the most common technical setup issues and uh, how to address them. As far as after the tracking is configured, in the Google Analytics user interface or in the admin setup of GA, there's other things that you want to keep in mind with how you actually set up the processing. First is making sure, again, if you have mobile apps and web platforms both, uh, if they're tracked together or separately in the UI as well, not just in the data collection, but in the UI uh, of Google Analytics, maybe you want to combine those or not. That's kind of a key key concept here. If you're looking at aggregate numbers and they don't look complete, maybe you're missing a particular platform. Uh, in Google Analytics, you can set up filters or other various settings that can also affect your data collection. Um, so if you're familiar with Google Analytics, you know uh, in the views portion, you can split up the data using filters, but you want to be careful because this permanently alters data from the time filters are set up for that view until they're modified. So for example, if you create a new view and you say only include traffic from Saudi Arabia to this view, but one week later you say, in fact, I'm going to change this filter and add in UAE, include Saudi Arabia or UAE traffic into this view. That first week that you were tracking the filter as just Saudi Arabia, that cannot be changed. That data will only show Saudi Arabia traffic. As soon as you make the change in the filter moving forward, will the new logic be applied and data will flow in. So reviewing filters is a big part of our uh, auditing process. Other settings to keep in mind can include default pages. If you're using those and not using those properly, we rarely use the default page setting on the view level um, because it changes how your page dimensions appear in the reports. Session or campaign timeouts, we rarely modify the preset um, values for these that Google provides in the property settings. But if you make your session timeout longer, that means people can stay idle longer without having their session expire. If you make it shorter, that means they need to be really engaged to keep the session going. Otherwise, you might have users uh, generating a lot of sessions because they don't do anything for a shorter period of time, less than 30 minutes, and then they continue on. Of course, bots and spam are... Um, it's a problem with uh, digital analytics today. So Google has some automatic ways to exclude bots and robots uh, or like uh, spiders that are going to your platforms via just a checkbox in the view settings. You can also add spam filters um, to block out any known spammers that might not be considered a bot, but just spam sites. Uh, there's lots of content online. Brian Clifton has written a really great article. I think Simo Hava has written a really great article about spam filters specifically uh, that you can leverage to block that out. Um, if you have a team that's all in one specific office, it might be worth considering filtering them out if they're all working on the website. Internal traffic can really skew your data because your internal team might be doing a lot of testing or trying to review the site, if you, especially for a digital company. Um, so filtering internal traffic can be an important step uh, to make sure there's not um, non-consumer data. Of course, if your business sells a product where your employees are also your consumers, you might need to decide for your organization, should we exclude them or not because they're technically consumers, but they're also employees. You know, we don't have a best practice in this case because we've done both ways, both processes. But typically, if your employees are consumers, we wouldn't filter them out. They're consumers. You want to see consumer data. Other very minute things, but worth checking. And again, this is more like a checklist for you to review with your settings. Uh, time zone, currency, and e-commerce settings at the view level within the Google Analytics admin panel. Really important to make sure it matches your business or your properties because without the right time zone or currency, you might not see the data as expected. It will track, but it might not be shown at the right time or the revenue might be highly inflated if you're tracking it one way on your platforms, but in the properties or in the reports, it's being displayed as a different, uh, different currency. The conversion there might be really thrown off. And then there's other settings that you need to turn on in Google Analytics to even allow reports to be viewed. Um, Another pitfall is just how you track campaigns, advertising, marketing, any activity that you're doing to bring people to the site or apps. 
uh, it's really important to set up the proper UTM campaign tracking. If you don't have that in place, you can see a very large volume of what's called referral or direct traffic, um, which Google simply will see or, or output as the volumes that, uh, or what sources are performing the best. But then that might not be exactly what you're looking for. If you want to analyze where to invest your marketing spend or where to invest most of your marketing time and energy, you'd really want to make sure it's tracked properly with UTM campaign uh, URLs, um, as well as the process to actually see those sources of traffic in GA. Um, channel groupings, there are some default channel grouping logic set up. So Google will identify when traffic comes into the site or app, how to bucket them appropriately into a channel. For example, if someone's using google.com and clicks on a non-paid ad, sorry, just a search result that's not an ad, uh, Google will automatically recognize that as organic search versus if they clicked on an ad on google.com like AdWords, it'll automatically bucket it as paid search. But a lot of channels and campaigns are not covered in the automatic pre-built channel groupings, so you might want to customize them uh, to make sure they follow your logic for the UTM process or uh, how you're tracking your campaign specifically. We talked a little bit about referral exclusion rules, but uh, if you ever have your consumers exiting the site to a third-party site and then coming back, for example, during a checkout process, people can pay through PayPal or some external third-party payment gateway, if they have to leave the site to pay and then get redirected back to the site, if you don't set up a referral exclusion rule for that particular domain that they're exiting to, it'll override the source that originally brought the user to the site and claim all of that conversion credit. What we've seen in the past is uh, for organizations that don't have this set up, a user can go into the checkout flow, click to pay through a payment gateway like 3D Secure, come back to the thank you page, and that order or that revenue that's captured on the thank you page appears like it's coming entirely from 3D Secure or PayPal or whatever the payment gateway is because the referral exclusion was not set up to ignore that domain and look at the original source of traffic that brought the user to the site. So it can really change how you analyze your data and, and make business decisions. We talked about Google Analytics and AdWords not linked. This can cause errors with how you see your paid search data. If you use UTM parameters or UTM campaign tagging on internal site links, this can cause all sorts of issues with overriding your source of traffic, similar to the referral exclusion example I just gave. So don't use UTM parameters internally. We would suggest if you want to track clicks on certain links, use events, the event tracking. Uh, internal links should not have UTM parameters. They should only be for external links, bringing people to the website or mobile app. Um, and then make sure it's very, very consistent uh, with how you track your UTM parameters or different sources of traffic. Because if you use UTM campaign tracking, which is adding simply parameters to the end of a, a URL that you post on social media or email, et cetera, to bring people to the site. If you use capital letters in one link, but not capital letters in another link, Google will not be able to merge those. It'll automatically see that as two different sources of traffic that you're trying to track uh, the users coming to the site. Uh, the last pitfall to describe before we close off with some tips and tricks and tools is uh, reporting setup. So when you build a report, keep in mind that not all dimensions and metrics work together. If you're looking at a metric such as um, revenue, but you're looking at a dimension like page, there's only one page that has revenue, and that's the thank you page. So those don't make sense to go together. So that would be one reason why uh, you know, the reports might look weird is the dimensions and metrics just do not flow together. Sampling, that's a big problem if you have a really high volume site or app. Google will uh, provide just a subset of the data when they build or display the reports if you have a really high volume. For example, if you have the number is if you have more than 500,000 sessions uh, in any day range you're looking at and you're applying some customization to the reports, Google will only show you a subset of data up to 500,000 sessions for you to analyze in that particular report. Um, this is just to keep the processing of the UI very fast or the querying and output of the reports very fast. 
all standard pre-built reports, like when you first log into GA, all of those reports are pre-configured, pre-aggregated, so they're unsampled. Even if you have millions of sessions, if you don't apply any customization, if you don't make Google re-query the report, it'll be completely unsampled and you should be good. Um, in general, we suggest keeping consistency with how you run analysis so you don't combine tons of different metrics together. And as you launch new campaigns or make changes to your configuration or your business makes a big decision on a new initiative, add an annotation. It's a quick note in Google Analytics to identify what happened on a certain date so that later on, if you see a spike or dip in traffic, you can understand what actually happened by referencing that previous annotation. So I know that was a lot of different pitfalls, and if you don't have as much experience with Google Analytics, um, you, some of these terms and um, explanations might not make as much sense. Feel free to ping me, or uh, you can check out our blog and YouTube page to see more details about what is sampling, annotations, etc. But I wanted to give you guys the list of things to check uh, or things to ensure are properly set up or your processes are sound so that when you look at the data, you can understand what you're uh, analyzing. Okay, some ideas about testing because I know we're uh, shortly running out of time here. Testing Google Analytics, we do it in a number of ways, uh, whether that's real-time reports, if you're using Google Tag Manager, preview mode, also using what's called the GA Debugger Chrome extension. Um, using this Chrome extension, you can go to any website, see the tags that are firing and all the attributes included. I have a screenshot or two about how this one works. I'll get to that in a second. Um, you can also just validate the Google Analytics data that you have versus your backend, see if there's discrepancies or not. What we target is a 95% accuracy in GA uh, compared to backend for orders and revenue because that makes us confident that we are tracking everything in GA that we need to make sound decisions. We can't have 100% accuracy in GA because some users just block JavaScript or don't, um, don't have GA tracking for whatever reason. So 95% is what we target for the comparison to the back end. Now what I want to talk about is a little bit of our tool, Tag Inspector, because we built this tool to automate some of the data validation and testing process. So if you're not familiar with Tag Inspector, I highly recommend you go to taginspector.com and uh, run a free scan. Essentially, what the way this product works, uh, there's two parts to it. The first part is a scanner where we can put in a URL or domain and send our crawler to go to that site, not inflate in analytic traffic, but go through different pages of that site and identify what's tracking or what's not, what different vendors or technologies or pixels and tags are deployed, and what pages they might be missing. So my first point earlier where I said GA might needs to be deployed across every single page of the site, Tag Inspector is an automatic way to check which pages might be missing, Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, etc. So it's really designed to help you monitor or do a compliance check to see where data is being tracked or where it might be missing. So the scanner is at the high level here just to see tags that are on the site or, or not, but then you can also build validation rules so that, or, or a policy to say, when you, Tag Inspector, when the crawler scans the entire site, if any page is missing Google Analytics, send me an email. So if you're a type of site or you're working with an organization that's deploying a lot of new pages constantly, instead of manually testing to make sure GA and GTM are always deployed on these new pages, you can have Tag Inspector scanning automatically on a daily or weekly basis and providing you alerts or reports saying, hey, we saw this new page was created, it's missing Google Analytics. So the time to validate is greatly reduced and it gives you an automatic report to see when tags are set up or not. Another part of, Google, of Tag Inspector that's very useful is our real-time capabilities. And what this is, uh, different than a crawler, Tag Inspector real-time is actually a tag itself or a pixel that can sit on your site or sit within a Google uh, Tag Manager, Tag Management System, and it will listen and monitor all users coming to your site and understanding what tags or data is being collected for all users as they navigate. So again, you can build val validation rules to say, if any user comes to the site and GA does not fire for that user, send us an alert. Or more specifically, 
if any user is completing an order and that order does not have order ID, revenue, and a few other key attributes tracked, send us an alert because that means something is missing in our tracking um, and our technical setup that's causing people that hit the conversion page or make an order to not be tracked properly. The data is missing. So our tool has alerts that trigger based off of these actions that users can take in real time, meaning within the same day we can see, or as it's happening, if any user completes an action and the attributes are missing or uh, the tags and pixels are not firing as intended, we would get a valid or we get an alert sent to us. This is just a screenshot to show you how that would look in GA. Uh, you can see for this particular example, we have lots of e-commerce rules like making sure product brand, product price, SKU, uh, currency code are all included. How many times has this validation failed versus pass, and what's the rate of failure? So we can see at the specific attribute level which ones we need to identify or tell our technical and development teams to fix or improve because it's missing from a lot of our uh, deployments. So let me know if you guys have any questions about Tag Inspector. Happy to provide a demo. I know the Tag Inspector team is constantly doing webinars about how that works and, and testing and validation as well. Uh, GA Debugger is a very easy and great tool to use. It actually looks like this little Chrome extension here. I right now have it turned off. Um, this allows you to see data in real time as you manually click through your different pages on your browser. You can see what data is being passed to Google Analytics within the console of your browser. So this can show you here, I'm just going to make this full screen, a quick example of the debugger tool turned on. And in your Chrome browser, if you have the console opened in the developer tools, if uh, to get there, you simply right click on the screen of the website you're on, click inspect element. And then you'll pop open this developer's console. You can click on the little console toggle. And if you have the GA Debugger Chrome extension turned on, you can click through different pages of the site and see the data that's actually being passed with the specific attributes that's being passed on each different page. So if you're looking to collect extra attributes like the page type or category or product name, product brand, uh, on an add to cart action or a completed order, you can see those in the hit here within the console tab. So this is how we validate web implementations often. Uh, that along with tag using real-time reports in Google Analytics, uh, which you can see both page views that are happening in real-time and events. This is limited to only a few attributes, but it's a good starting point to see how people are actually clicking on your site or if you can see yourself um, as you click around your particular site to validate the tracking is set up properly. If you're using Google Tag Manager, preview mode is very, very useful. If you toggle on preview mode, when you go to your website or platform, you can see the tags and technologies that are firing and where, as well as which attributes or variables are deployed within these tags. So if you need to not only make sure a tag is firing, uh, the data is collected, but the specific attributes are set properly, you can use Google Tag Manager to identify that as well. The last thing I want to talk about is just validating on mobile apps, because it is, in fact, possible. Um, using a tool called Charles Proxy, there's various others, but we like to use uh, the tool called Charles Proxy. You can see data that's being captured off your mobile applications. So as you're clicking through your mobile app, similar to the GA Debugger, you'll have Charles Proxy showing you the different requests and attributes specifically that are being tracked as you click through. The point of this is to ensure that for certain actions, you have the required attributes that you need. For example, on an add to cart or completed order for e-commerce, you need to make sure you have the product name, ID, quantity, price, all of that level of information set up in your actual hits being sent to GA. So that's where Charles Proxy for Apps comes in handy. And you can see, when you look into a particular request or hit, you can see it's split up similarly to how it's split up in GA Debugger for browsers, where each attribute has its own line that you can uh, monitor or assess if it was collected properly or not. Well, I rushed through that, but we're right at the end. I haven't seen any questions or comments come through, so if anyone has any questions or comments, we'll spend the last few minutes. I'll hang around to see if anything comes in. But uh, as a thank you, 
uh, for everyone, I want to encourage you to go to our upcoming events. Um, we have several webinars, lots of different uh, content that we can share about using digital analytics or making sure you have the right setup. Uh, of course, you can feel free to email me directly, um, contact us, or if you want to try out Tag Inspector, if you're interested in a demo or seeing how that can help automate your testing process, feel free to email our product specialist, Lucas. Uh, his email is shown here. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and just stop the recording. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Hopefully, it was valuable for you, and uh, we hope to see you in a future event. Thanks so much.